All right, welcome uh, again. Um, as everybody knows, uh, Somalia has long been an image of insecurity and uh, state weakness. Yet, you know, over the last several years, we've seen important progress, uh, some of which hasn't been recognized. Under uh, President Farmajo, uh, we've seen uh, extensive efforts to try to build relationships with the uh, international community, AMISOM, with uh, federal states within Somalia. Um, there have also, has also been a number of security reforms that have been initiated in the past year. And these have collectively contributed to an improved security environment uh, within Somalia, which is most vividly seen in the decline in civilian attacks and fatalities uh, over the last year. In fact, 2018 is uh, shaping up to see about a 50% reduction in civilian deaths in Somalia compared to 2017. And this would be the lowest uh, civilian fat fatality rate since 2012. Uh, nonetheless, as we all know, many security challenges remain. Uh, Al-Shabaab uh, is very resilient, and it continues to conduct uh, many attacks throughout the country. In fact, um, uh, on average, the last several years, uh, um, Al-Shabaab has uh, uh, undertaken um, about 1,500 attacks across the country, um, making it the most active uh, uh, violent extremist organization on the continent. Uh, moreover, uh, Somalia continues to struggle with various uh, governance and institutional issues that contribute to building a stable security environment, issues like reconciliation, inclusion, building a um, a stable uh, Somali National Army, power sharing between uh, Mogadishu and the federal member states, among other things. So our interest today is to um, examine just what progress has been made over the, the last couple of years, um, and then to review what are the um, realistic expectations of continued progress here uh, in the next couple of years, and what are the policy priorities that need to be pursued both domestically and among external uh, partners to see that progress sustained. And in doing so, we keep in mind um, a couple of important milestones. Uh, AMISOM is expected to uh, begin to draw down its 20,000 force uh, uh, effort uh, starting next year. And uh, Somalia is uh, slated to have presidential elections in 2020. So to cover these issues, we're, we're very fortunate to have with us three distinguished guests who have been uh, intimately following these issues. And uh, we're particularly uh, grateful to have with us uh, Abdi Saeed uh, Ali to my right, the National Security Advisor to the President of the Federal uh, Republic of Somalia. Um, and there are uh, more detailed bios in your program, so I'm not going to go through all of the, the background. But uh, just to say that uh, as part of his responsibility as National Security Advisor, um, uh, Mr. Ali has been responsible for the strategic oversight and daily management of security policy in Somalia covering military police and intelligence institutions. And prior to his appointment uh, last year, um, he uh, served in a number of uh, regional uh, advisory and, and analyst roles for the Horn of Africa, including as the regional policy, uh, political advisor to the European Union, special representative for the Horn of Africa. And he's also been an author and, and scholar, making a number of valuable uh, contributions, including um, uh, a widely cited piece um, that he wrote with us uh, at the Africa Center on uh, violent extremism in East Africa. Um, following him, we have to my left uh, Dr. Andre Lesage, uh, and Dr. Lesage is the director of 
SAGE Research, which focuses on uh, research analysis and strategic advisory services in global conflict areas. Um, Andre is an uh, old colleague uh, uh, and friend of the Africa Center, having been a senior fellow here for uh, a number of years, and, uh, and then subsequently uh, he was a, uh, um, a fellow at uh, our sister center here at, at NDU, the Institute for National Strategic Studies. And uh, as many people know, uh, Andre is uh, one of the foremost experts in the United States on Somalia. And uh, he is also a, uh, a highly respected writer on counterterrorism in Africa, publishing a number of books and articles and, uh, and other uh, thoughtful reports. And then to my right, to my far right, is Dr. Shannon Smith. Um, uh, and she is the professor of practice and director of engagement at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Um, and uh, prior to her time at the Africa Center, uh, Dr. Smith serves as a, served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Africa, where she oversaw U.S. East Africa policy. Um, and so she's had uh, many uh, um, previous engagements uh, and, and, and um, you know, deep policy um, uh, reviews on Somalia over that time. Uh, prior to her time at State, uh, Dr. Smith also spent a number of years on Capitol Hill, where she was a senior policy advisor for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on Africa for global health, peacekeeping, and, and conflict issues. So our three panelists are going to bring very different perspectives uh, on what's going on in Somalia. And in the process, we're hoping to get um, um, you know, some thoughtful exchanges on where we're at and, and where we need to go to continue to see the sustained progress. So our plan will be that uh, um, Abdi Said will lead us off uh, and give us his perspective on what's changed uh, uh, under the current administration. And then we'll turn to, to Andre and then have Shannon uh, finish up. And then we'll open up for comments, questions, uh, and, and some back and forth. So with that, uh, let me turn it up to you, obviously. Uh, thank you uh, to Joe and his team for convening us uh, today. And good morning to you all for coming to discuss Somalia's security landscape here. Joe has invited me to outline to you the progress we have made in the security sphere since President Farmajo took office last year and to share the challenges and explain how we are building Somalia's uh, security institutions. Combating uh, corruption, working to build political consensus, and how we are working to build uh, or rebuild the social contract between the government and our citizens in order to restore trust and, and to counter terrorism. I will also touch on the regional dynamics in the Horn of Africa and the impact the Gulf crisis is having in Somalia. And there is much to discuss, so I, will, I look forward to engaging with you on these issues today. Historically, when people have thought about Somalia, they thought about only challenges. And they have seen the country torn apart, apart by conflict, battling vicious and, and resilient uh, counterintelligence and counterinsurgence, and governments have struggled to maintain control beyond a small part of the, of the capital, one which was recipient of aid rather than active partner in its generation and displacement. Since President Farmaggio took office just over a year ago, that environment has altered. The challenges remain, of course, but our willingness and ability to tackle them has changed. And throughout uh, my remarks, Today, I urge you to see Somalia as it is today and as it has the potential to be in the future rather than how it has been perceived in the past. We had key agreements in, in, in Somalia's complex business. For President Formaggio last year, right after taking office in April 2017, the federal government and federal member states agreed on a national security architecture just a couple of months after the president took office. 
The architecture agreed a number of Somali security forces, military, police, the civilian oversight of the executive of the armed forces, the distribution of security forces at the federal and state level. It realigned uh, the Somali National Army uh, to, to sectors that reflect the newly formed uh, states, uh, federal member states. It also set out the command and control of Somali security forces and the roles of, and responsibility of the institutions, both, both at the federal and, and state levels. It also underlined the, the physical, uh, outlined the physical responsibilities for the Somali security forces at the federal and state level. This was a land, landmark agreement, and its implementation will be foundation for Somali security forces and the shape our security forces uh, institutions will take over the years to come. Then in December 2017, the federal government of Somalia began a process to develop a plan to gradually transition security responsibility away from AMISOM and our international partners to the security forces and to the Somali security forces and institutions. The federal government led the development of the plan with the federal member states. AMISOM and troop contributing countries, and also our uh, international partners. We set, we set out a vision of transition to Somali security forces, uh, to Somali security uh, responsibility. And it's not about handover of security responsibility only. While the transition plan does include the handover of tasks from AMISOM to Somali security forces, it's not limited to this. There are many areas of activity which are not directly linked to, to AMISOM's presence in our, our longer-term institutional capacity building work uh, in order to ensure we build Somalia's state to support the transition process in the long term. Transition is ultimately about Somalia state building and peace building. With the emergence of effective Somali institutions, our strategy is to implement a comprehensive approach to security transition that is not only military, but also equally focused on governance, local, uh, local governance, reconciliation, state building activities, stabilization, but also includes uh, the expansion of local policing and justice. This means political and economic measures to support and sustain the transition at the federal, state, and local uh, level. To prove this concept of transition, we selected initial pilot locations to, to trial a joint planning approach and to demonstrate the effects of aligning Somali-led efforts with the international uh, partners to support a multiplying effect. These initial uh, locations are the main roads between uh, the strategic road is between Mogadishu and uh, Baidawa, Mogadishu Palatwin, uh, and also Mogadishu Stadium. So the involvement of federal member states and Banadir Regional Administration was critical to the development of, of the transition plan and will remain an essential component of its implementation. During the development of the plan, the federal government led visits to each of the federal member states and also uh, hosted uh, the international partners for detailed planning sessions. For the next phase of the priority locations, the implementation team has agreed to devolve the planning at the regional security level, uh, regional security council levels, in order to ensure local uh, ownership and expertise guides the plan to build the capacity of the regional security offices, a key element of the national security architecture. By devolving the planning, we hope to capture the local knowledge and expertise that will shape the detailed plans and ensure that activities are representative of the needs of the communities in each location. Success in the transition planning for Somalia to assume responsibility for its security 
but security is not an end itself. By providing security, we hope to see the return of normalcy for the people of Somalia, with freedom to move around without the threat of al-Shabaab to business, to open businesses, to play a sport, go to school, engage in politics under protection of the rule of law and the protection of their human rights. Our vision of normalcy includes appropriate security forces such as the community police as the primary security provider and the gradual demilitarization of the country. These goals will not be achieved overnight and along the way they are indicators of success. The handover of key national institutions such as such as the stadium opening up of the strategic roads, the reconfiguration of Amazon from military to police support for our security support, uh, implementation of community-based projects are all intended to improve the lives of the Somalis. Over the last 10 years, the conversation about security in Somalia has been about military operations air strikes, offensive operations against al-Shabaab. These are important components of the fight against terrorism. But we would all acknowledge that, that terrorism cannot be defeated by military means alone. We recognize that communities to resist al-Shabaab, the state must provide basic functions, including access to justice, basic services, alternative livelihoods, and protection from violence. We believe that in fully implementing the transition plan, including the important emphasis we, we place it on the building of local uh, government capacity, reconciliation, community based uh, engagement, job creation, will, will be better able to provide this for the people, for the Somali people. And alongside the community based pilot projects, one of our key institutional priorities is reform of the Somali National Army. In the National Security Arch Architecture, we agreed to construct a national army that is avoid avoidable, accountable, inclusive, under civilian oversight, able to provide security for the Somali. Effective and transparent financial and human resource systems will put in place, as well as the prerequisite framework to ensure the human rights compliance. This ambition requires multiple long-term strands of activity, including force generation, the challenges of force co composition, command and control, training and equipping our, our personnel. There are many challenges to which we link back to the fundamental challenges of state building in Somalia. How we foster a sense of national identity, agreements between federal and federal member states on resourcing and supplying force, force elements, the roles and responsibilities of the army as we gradually migrate security in towns and cities away from the army to police protection. How we do all of this while fighting an active counterinsurgence pattern. To understand the current status of the Somali National Army and where we were starting from, the president and the leadership took the unprecedented step of conducting an operational readiness assessment of the Somali National Army in order to have an honest, transparent baseline on which to base our progress. It took a certain amount of courage to do this, to be transparent about the lack, lack of equipment, training, and manpower that's available in our fight against al-Shawab, despite many years of international uh, investment. The aura was a challenging moment for both for Somalia in recognizing how far we have to go to build up the, our capabilities and how much reform is required in order to ensure the future investment are not squandered for personal benefit. But it, all, it was also a challenging moment for our international partners to recognize that because their investment had not been 
coordinated and transparently given, that it was easy for those investments to disappear with little benefits for, by those with strong vested interest in seeing reform fail and, and transparency sidelined. In the light of the aura, the president personally took control of the many of the reforms necessary to, con uh, to correct these failings. He moved into the Ministry of uh, Defense for a couple of uh, weeks in order to assess firsthand, which was required, and to use his personal authority to reinforce the urgency of reform. A key moment for state building and rebuilding the trust between communities and, and tackling corruption through increasing transparency and accountability. Like many, like many states emerging from conflict, this has been dragged on on previous attempts to reform. We acknowledge there are many for whom the status quo is profitable and beneficial we have vested interest in under, undermining our efforts. Uh, who have vested interest, of course, in, in under, undermining our, our efforts. As the federal government set out in the financial governance report in May uh, 2018, good financial governance is essential to Somalia's state building progress. Not only does good financial uh, management provide means to tackle insecurity and violence through increased revenue generation and future funding avenues. But it can also remove some of the drivers of insecurity by addressing perceptions of inequality, tackling corruption, and improving trust. Gradually, we are putting in place mechanisms that reduce unilateral decisions and institutionalize the decisions of government rather than allowing them to be taken by individuals. For example, we have uh, introduced a new security assistance policy to increase the, the transparency and uh, accountability of the security sector, among other things, to streamline the decision making for contracts related, uh, related to the security. The economic community of the cabinet has put in place a set of interim procurement requirements which govern all federal government ministries until such a time the procurement act is fully implemented. These steps are important in increasing oversight and building uh, confidence. We are realistic about the time frames it will take to instigate change, not only in our system, but in the mindsets of our citizens, our civil servants, our politicians, and our partners. As you know from history, this is not an easy task. This kind of uh, reforms take decades, and Somalia is at the start of our state building journey. We are trying to build on what we have and to take what institutions and systems of governance and representation exist, and build on and then adapt them for a modern, inclusive uh, state. Let me say a few words on, on the regional uh, dynamics and the impact. Somalia's strategic position is both a blessing and, and a challenge. Our proximity to the Gulf neighbors has built strong partnership and brotherly relations. But our proximity also impacts our security as the, uh, the conflict in, in Yemen poses the risk of conflict extending across the Gulf of Aden. In, in December 2017, Houthi rebels in Yemen released a video threatening a Berber port if it was lead, leased to UAE. Puntilan remains the primary entry point for illicit of weapons uh, originating from many other areas, including Yemen, uh, typically delivered by skiffs. These are small boats capable of making the journey in a single day. As well as the threat of al-Shabaab, Daesh has recently expanded its activities in Puntilan and also in Mogadishu with similar extortion tactics targeting businesses. Media 
estimated that ISIS collects around hundreds of thousands uh, a month from extortion of businesses and wealthy individuals in Puntland and in Mogadishu. In addition to the threat of terrorism, relations between the Gulf states have been evidence in support for Somalia. We are acutely aware Somalia needs all of our international partners, and we have no desire to alienate anyone who is willing to work with us for the better future for Somalia. But the current political crisis in the Gulf means that agreements and negotiations involving one of the Gulf parties risking drawing Somalia into the crisis. We need to avoid negative consequences for Somalia at a time when the country remains fragile and to ensure that outside divisions do not undermine our state building efforts. However, turning back to the continent, it's positive time in the Horn of Africa, and Somalia can only benefit from closer ties between Ethiopia and Eritrea, the strong bilateral re relations which we have with our neighbors, uh, including Djibouti. As we move on from a period of frozen conflict and tolerance for armed opposition movements, Somalia has a role to play in the new era of regional cooperation, maximizing the strategic potential of the Horn of Africa and building a peaceful and prosperous future across the region and in partnership with our Gulf neighbors. To conclude, these remarks re represent just a small amount of what the federal government and the President Farmajo is working to achieve and the progress we are making. I ask you at the start to see Somalia through new eyes and to look to our potential and our future. Our pro progress is not linear. There have been and will be setbacks, and the pace of progress may not be as fast as we might like. Nevertheless, we believe that by making steady progress, by ensuring that each area of reform is Somali-led process, we can continue Somalia's upward trajectory. I thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Abdesid. Um, uh, so you've laid out for us a very broad vision for the positive trajectory of security in, in Somalia, recognizing that this is a comprehensive process. It's just not a technical solution. And I appreciate you bringing in the political and governance transparency aspects that are required to, to make this a reality urgency of reform, and, and helpfully, uh, since we tend to be so inwardly focused on Somalia, to, to you know, remind us of the, the regional importance of what a stable Somalia could mean for the Horn of Africa. You know, for many of us, uh, our whole professional careers have not uh, have seen that. So um, that's a, it's a really helpful vision for us to think about. So uh, let me turn it over to, to Andre for your thoughts. Well, thank you very much to Joe and Africa Center for the invitation to be here, and also to Abdi Saeed for making time in his busy schedule before running up to the United Nations in New York. Um, I think Abdi Saeed set the stage extremely well. Uh, he's talked about some enormous positive changes that have taken place in Somalia, and particularly if we're looking at a time frame of over the past, say, just five years, uh, really some substantial changes have taken place. I mean, not least of which is the formal you know, recognition of the federal government of Somalia, uh, filling a void and ending, I think, that era, at least, uh, of, of what we called state collapse. Um, but there are four more fundamental changes that are taking place that are not just architectural. I think uh, we've seen incredible levels of development taking place, not just in the capital city of Mogadishu, uh, but in other parts of Somalia as well, be that Pasaso uh, or Kismaya or Baidoa, quite often led by an extremely vibrant private sector. Um, the Somali parliament has passed some very important uh, items of legislation, and certain key ministries, uh, say Ministry of Planning uh, within Somalia, are really starting to function and engage with the international community in a very positive way to lay out plans for Somalia's continued development over time. Uh, we actually have early planning this time for rather more robust elections as we look forward to 2020, trying to correct some of the limitations and mistakes that have been made in the past. 
And certainly we can talk about uh, efforts to reduce corruption and improve financial transparency, which have recently you know, earned uh, the federal government and all of Somalia a lot of recognition from international financial institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, all the rest. Um, also critically, at the more local or uh, regional state level in Somalia, and we finally do have an architecture laid out for what Somalia's federal system is going to look like. Uh, this still needs negotiation on issues of how the Constitution is going to be finalized, how revenue sharing is going to take place, how states and uh, the national level will cooperate in uh, matters of election. But the fact that we have this federal architecture and these states, which really represent each in its own right, its own sense of, uh, of a power sharing agreement between competing communities, competing factions at the local level in Somalia is really key. So looking at this in that kind of, say, five-year time span, it's really quite remarkable the progress that, that has been made in, uh, in the country. However, we do have some major challenges that, that face us today, and uh, I don't think we should shy away from those as we talk about the state of uh, Somalia's security landscape. Uh, in particular, the struggle to combat al-Shabaab, I would say, is pretty much at a stalemate right now. Uh, since 2015, with the capture of uh, major towns in Ghetto and Bay region, uh, Bardera and, uh, and, uh, and Dinsur, we really haven't had a major change in the front lines. Uh, the long-expected Juba River Valley offensive to actually liberate the remaining you know, bridge towns, if you will, uh, on the Juba River, uh, Jamame, Jilib, Wale, Sakao, has been pending for, for many years. I mean, frankly, pending since the, the Kenyans helped to liberate Kismayo from al-Shabaab control in roughly 2012. Uh, that has meant that we have more disruption operations, small-scale operations uh, supported by AMISOM and the Somali National Army that can go and disrupt al-Shabaab activities in a particular village, but are unable to hold ground over time. So those operations might go and chase Shabab elements out of a, a town, but then a couple hours later, those forces, be it Amisom or SNA, have to retreat back to a forward operating base, and al Shabab returns to control. Uh, in many instances, we have had a very positive example set by some clans, subclans, trying to resist al Shabab, particularly in recent months, efforts to resist forced recruitment of children. Um, but we've actually not seen an ability by the federal government or the federal states or, frankly, the international community to actually surge the required security and financial assistance to support those clans in their longer-term resistance uh, to al-Shabaab. As a result, al-Shabaab basically surrounds and crushes a resistance movement, and it'll take you know, months, if not several years, in order to kind of resurrect that clan's ability to stand independently, to join a federal state, to join the federal government, and to push back against al-Shabaab. Uh, the Somali National Army, I think Abdi Said is very correct in saying that uh, we have a much better understanding of the challenges facing the army today, uh, particularly after President Formaggio launched the, uh, the Operational Readiness Assessment, the ORA, uh, in terms of its weaknesses in command and control in numbers, uh, reported numbers versus the reality on the ground in terms of weapon systems. Uh, unfortunately, this is something that hasn't been you know, addressed to the point that we, we actually know what the problems are increasingly, but the reforms are not taking place to make the SNA more effective in late 2018 by comparison with where they were in mid-2017. So I think that's something that we could explore a bit further uh, in the discussion as to what steps are in place today particularly with new security leadership in the country under the new Chief of Defense Forces, uh, Dahir Elmi, uh, to actually get the SNA moving out in the right direction, uh, moving beyond disruption operations, maybe able to support more some of these uh, local resistance efforts to al-Shabaab. And then there is this long-term discussion that's going on about other effective forces in the country that really aren't part of the Somali National Army and really don't have sufficient support to fight Shabab on their own. These are state-level forces, uh, the Puntland Darawish, the Southwest State Special Police, the Jubaland Darawish. All of these are officially recognized parts of the Somali national security apparatus. They're just recognized functioning at the state level as paramilitary forces uh, trying to combat al-Shabab, 
However, continued, I'd say, political and policy issues uh, surrounding the status of these forces means they really aren't receiving international support, even if they are the closest to the ground, the forces with some of the best in local organic intelligence about the enemy. And because they are fighting to protect their own home areas, their own families uh, very close to Shabab, they are some of the most motivated forces we have uh, uh, in, in the counterterrorism fight at the moment. Um, regarding the state of al-Shabaab in all of this, um, they are pretty much, I'd say, right now in their comfort zone. They do not control uh, major cities in most cases. Uh, I'd say Jilib is a major exception. Uh, that's kind of one of their hubs of operations down in the Juba River Valley. Uh, but they are able to exist in the bush in rural areas in a way that Amos Am and the SNA currently cannot get at them. This has enabled al-Shabaab to set up effectively a parallel governance system that challenges the authority of the federal government at the margins of urban areas. Uh, we see al-Shabaab running courts. We see them certainly imposing taxes. I mean, this is a constant complaint, and those taxes can be financial taxes. Uh, they can be you know, demands for livestock or ag agricultural produce. And in the worst cases, when uh, local communities can't provide material assets, they demand their children. And so this level of forced recruitment of children is really reaching an intolerable point for most Somali communities. But again, they lack the wherewithal to actually resist Shabab and are forced, uh, forced to, to give over uh, their families. And then finally, through proselytization and Dawa and all the rest, you have al-Shabab really continuing uh, to exercise a great deal of social control. And as much as the federal government of Somalia and its international partners have a certain vision for Somalia's future, uh, sadly, al-Shabaab is actually pushing a very different vision and trying to push that into the minds of, uh, of young people. Uh, obviously, we can talk about regular attacks. I mean, it was almost a year ago, uh, just in a couple of days, the 14 October attacks that took place in Mogadishu, one of the largest ever suicide bombings uh, that we've seen. Uh, and al-Shabaab does not always just do major attacks. On a regular basis, they're conducting assassinations against government officials, against civil society leaders in the country, and they seem to be able to do this with impunity. The federal government did a great job trying to prevent IEDs going off in Mogadishu earlier this year, and I think helped by some rather extreme rainfall, um, but the efforts that they did erecting blockades around the city also shut down commerce, also, also shut down civil movement. And as soon as those get lifted, you actually see al-Shabaab able to move its attacks back into town. Uh, we also have increased al-Shabaab activity in locations such as Ghetto, Middle Shabele, certainly a surge of operations uh, just the north of Mogadishu and up in Galmudug State in, in the center of the country. Uh, I'd say worrying from the international perspective for anyone who reads Kenyan newspapers was a report from back in about February of a potential VBID, again, leaving Somali territory and entering Kenyan territory being caught in the, the Merti area of Isiolo district on its way potentially to conduct an attack in Nairobi or another major urban uh, part of Kenya. Uh, I think we haven't really seen significant al-Shabaab external operations since the Westgate Mall attack, uh, the Garissa College massacre. So any indication uh, that the external operations elements of al-Shabaab are uh, increasing their capacity or desire to attack really needs to be taken seriously. And then finally, as Abdi Saeed mentioned, we also have the slow shift of ISIS operations outside of the pocket they've been in, um, south of Kandala, north of Eskushaban, in Puntland, with more and more small attacks, mostly assassinations, uh, down in Mogadishu and the outskirts of Mogadishu. These are small right now, but they really need to be addressed before they grow. And just like ISIS globally, we've seen a lot of extreme media attention or media savvy uh, by the ISIS guys actually videotaping some of the attacks. Uh, as we move forward, uh, and what are the requirements? I mean, I think Abdi Saeed's talked in general about a lot of these. I mean, implementation of the agreed national security architecture uh, is really critical. I mean, the national security architecture was something that was accomplished in the earliest days of the Formaggio administration. I think the discussions even happened before uh, Prime Minister Kaire uh, was selected. And, you know, this actually brought together in a very consensual way for negotiation the federal government leadership, but also the federal state leadership. Agreed on resectoring the SNA according to state boundaries, uh, agreed on establishing DENAB special operation units 
in all the different uh, states and sectors. And in both of those are you know, really might either happened or very much underway. The parts that have not really occurred are what we need to move out on next, I believe, which is internal reform of the SNA to make sure that we have appropriate and effective forces for each location, each you know, division or brigade, and that we actually push out support to places that are not just in and around Mogadishu. So the SNA that's actually fighting in the Juba River Valley, the SNA that needs to uh, fight to secure rural areas outside of Baidoa, not just the capital cities, uh, et cetera. Uh, regional security councils are supposed to be established and working with the National Security Advisor's Office in Mogadishu to actually improve communication and coordination, sort of delegation of authority from the national level in terms of authorities and resources, but then operational and tactical control down at the regional level, closer to the, the front lines, where AMISOM, SNA, state level forces and international partners can, can take the fight to Al-Shabaab. Um, all of this, however, really requires that a more fundamental issue be addressed, and, and this is something else we could possibly talk about in the, in the question and answer period, which is restarting the relationships between the federal government of Somalia and the federal states. Uh, despite very positive early 2017 working relationships, slowly uh, we've had this deterioration to where the Council of Interstate Cooperation just a couple of months ago did uh, at least temporarily you know, cease cooperation or cease formal discussions with the federal government until commitments made at previous National Security Council meetings are actually implemented. Uh, this impasse has been exacerbated by the Gulf crisis, most certainly, about uh, external rivalries playing themselves out in Somalia. But I think from an external observer's point of view, the biggest concern is that what was a very cooperative relationship early on has now deteriorated to a very zero-sum competition and a tit-for-tat struggle of uh, politicians challenging each other. And it's only with cooper cooperation across this divide national to state level that I think we're really going to get effective security forces, the ability to deal with al-Shabaab and ISIS in the short term, and then the ability to pursue the governance challenges, the justice challenges that Abdi Saeed talked about uh, over time. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, uh, Andre. That was a wonderful summary of uh, lots of activities that are going on and, and sort of giving us a context of where we're at currently. Certainly want to come back to, to Parts of that in our uh, discussion section, I especially want to highlight a couple of points you, you've talked about that um, don't get enough attention on the ideological elements of what Al-Shabaab is doing, um, uh, as well as uh, you know, how do you strengthen the, the local security um, uh, efforts and, and facilitate uh, more of that uh, collaboration so that can be effective uh, on the ground. Okay, um, let's uh, turn over to, to Shannon for your thoughts all right well in baseball it's a uh, an advantage of the home team to bat last um in this case uh it may be in that so much ground has been covered on the other hand so much ground has been covered um but i would just echo both the national security advisor and andre in in beginning by noting just how much progress has been made especially looking out over the last five ten years um i think it's really phenomenal and it's it, it's something that in general, um, you know, we can lag behind in Washington in, in recognizing change, and I think, think that it's important to do that. That said, this forward momentum is fragile, and it's incomplete. And the risks to that hard-won progress come not merely from al-Shabaab, which, as Andre noted, very vividly demonstrated almost a year ago today that it remains a very lethal and ruthless terrorist threat but from the extraordinarily difficult task of overcoming what one Somali minister once described to me as, quote, 20 years of amnesia when it comes to governance. I'm really hesitant today to think that I'm going to put on the table issues that the um, National Security Advisor is not already grappling with. Um, but he's grappling with so many, and the future of Somalia is so important to all of us. And because framing remarks can sometimes be useful, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and lay them out and proceed. So in thinking about this, I recalled from a literature class many, many years ago um, that in literary terms, conflict um, comes in three most basic forms. 
among them man versus man, or to bring our language into the 21st century, the individual versus the individual. Number two, the individual versus nature. And number three, the individual versus himself. And Somalia's challenges can be understood on all three of these levels and on multiple dimensions within them. So I'd like to think about these three literary typologies of conflict in the context of Somalia's efforts to carry out its transition plan for security, to reflect a bit on the role of the international community in this transition, and to lay out the stakes of why this transition matters in a world rife with competing issues. So consider first that most basic level of conflict. One protagonist, one or more antagonists. The Somali government faces a dangerous and ongoing insurgency in al-Shabaab, as well as threats from ISIS and other violent extremists. This threat has evolved over time. It is depleted today in some respects, but it is still resilient. On the positive side of the ledger, as, as um, previous speakers have noted, al-Shabaab has lost most of the territory it once held, and importantly, that means it lost a lot of the income it once controlled. Um, but it has certainly not been defeated. The force most responsible for rolling back al-Shabaab has been Amisom, but Somali national and regional forces are increasingly important in this effort. But as Andre said, there have not been major rollbacks of late. And in fact, al-Shabaab has managed to retake some territory after Amazon or other forces have pulled back from some forward operating bases. Further, as recent history has sadly demonstrated and studies by RAND and others have concluded, the loss of territory may cause terrorist groups to become more violent, not less. So what does it take then to alter these dynamics? How do we understand them in the context of multiple simultaneous but not necessarily synchronized transitions of Amazon drawdowns and Somali civil and military progressions. In his July assessment of the situation, UN Secretary General Guterres declared that, quote, Amazon remains indispensable to providing security and creating the necessary space for the political process to unfold until Somali institutions can shoulder that responsibility. In the same July report to the Security Council, the Secretary General stated that, quote, as currently manned, trained, and equipped, the Somali Army, National Army is a fragile force with extremely weak command and control and military capabilities, and added that it lacks a common doctrine, sustainment capacity, and infrastructure. Transforming the SNA means finding a way to break past patterns of engagement. The international community is throwing hundreds of millions of dollars at the problem of security, and trained tens of thousands of soldiers over the years, but many of those forces essentially melted away, often underfed, unmanaged, and unpaid. But as has been said, progress is underway. The Danab battalions are a promising sign of efforts to create a more effective representative force. But I fear that there's a basic tension between the timelines and vision for the construction and reform of the SNA and the National Security Advisor has been very frank about these challenges with us, and the timeline of the drawdown of Amazon forces. There is also a tension between the desire for that Amazon drawdown to be number one, conditions-based, and number two, grounded in clear target dates for transition and departure. It may be able to be one of those things. I am not convinced it can be both of them. But efforts to achieve security sector transformation are not taking place within a vacuum. And that brings us back to our second dimension of conflict within our literary trope, man versus nature. Somalia's security and political struggles are compounded by and can themselves then exacerbate the humanitarian, economic, and environmental challenges that the country faces. According to FuseNet estimates, 1.5 million people remain in crisis conditions or worse. That's actually a significant improvement. In 2017, over 6 million people were in need of humanitarian assistance and protection. The impact of the worsening weather cycle in recent years, however, has been significant and will continue to shape political and economic developments. Fundamentally, conflict and climate have collided in Somalia. Successive years of drought, interrupted by flooding, 
have triggered large-scale displacement and stripped already marginalized people and communities of assets and resources. Malnutrition rates and intercommunal tensions over access to water and grazing lands have all increased in recent years. As studies have shown then, Somalia is at the unfortunate center of the Venn diagram of countries that have the highest risk factors for political instability, the largest predict predicted increases in water scarcity, and the highest population growth rates. At last, the demographic component is important. Somalia has the second highest total fertility rate in the world, according to the World Bank, behind only Niger. Between now and 2030, its population is expected to grow by approximately 6 million people. The implications for these trends increase over time as the numbers multiply. But they're factors today and have to be an integral part of planning for tomorrow. The third dimension of conflict to return to our literary device, the individual versus him or herself is the most complex and for Somalia likely the most important. The lines of cleavage that run through Somalia take many and often overlapping forms. And I know both Andre and the advisor um, know this far better than I. But to go through some of these um, cleavages, Tensions between the center and the periphery pose a difficult challenge for a state trying to re-extend authority after those 20 years of amnesia. Clashes between states have added to overall fragility. Multiple regional forces and local militias sometimes uneasily coexist with one another and with Mogadishu. Clan allegiance and, and rivalries can compound those tensions. Somaliland has sought to carve out its own identity. Al-Shabaab is both a force for division within Somalia and subject to its own internal stresses, including those between foreign fighters and Somalis. Criminal violence as well as political assassinations claim lives and threaten growth. Women have paid a very high price for the conflict. According to UNDP's Gender Inequality Index, Somalia has one of the highest levels of gender inequality in the world. In Mogadishu and beyond, the existing political economy creates divisions between those who have benefit, benefited from Somalia's struggles and those who are working very hard to try to reform them. And while wrestling with all these internal challenges, Somalia is increasingly caught up in larger geopolitical rivalries, including those emanating from the Gulf, which then play out in internal political dynamics. In sum, the forces that could refracture Somalia are many, so both the national will and international support to help mend them must be considerable. In the face of these formidable forces, the creation of the federal states, the holding of the 2017 elections, the other steps and milestones that have been mentioned today stand as really considerable accomplishments. I absolutely want to uh, highlight that. Stabilization in the security sector is now intrinsically tied to further improvements in governance. Both demand the responsible management of resources and increased revenues for the state. For a country that has been ranked at the bottom of Transparency International's index of perceived corruption, creating trust is a core security demand. There has to be sufficient accountability to maintain popular support and to manage the natural inherent tensions inherent in a federal system, especially one so new and under so much stress. Revenue management is crucial to the reconstruction of the military and the police forces, and to the payment of salaries, the provision and maintenance of equipment, and the assumption of Somalia's intended roles within the security sector. The national security architecture and the national security advisors' you know, remarks today reflect a very inclusive and welcome vision of security that addresses issues such as the rule of law, local governance, and youth employment, and it recognizes them as building blocks of stability. Somalia's transformation is and must be its own, but the international community has a vested interest in this process, and that will not come to a close in 2020 or 2021 with the next elections. If Somali forces, as the NSA has said um, previously, must be able, accountable, affordable, and accepted. One could say the same thing about the international partners. Amazon forces need to be supported and equipped with the necessary tools to be able. International assistance needs to be accounted for. 
Too much money has gone into Somalia over the years and disappeared. The effort needs to be affordable in a world and even a continent of competing priorities Affordability demands better coordination and better stewardship, but also a recognition that stability will not come cheaply. And further turmoil in the future would cost still more. And it needs to be accepted. The international community must continue to accept a commitment to assistance while the Somali government sets the agenda. The stakes for Somalia, for East Africa, for the Red Sea, for the United States, for the broader international community are high. And they are higher, I fear, than is sometimes recognized. Al-Shabaab is and remains a transnational threat with ties to militants abroad and with destructive ambitions that may not be confined within Somalia's borders. Piracy is another risk, but so is the, you know, the threatened depletion of Somalia's resources, including fisheries. And oil exploration is only going to make this more complicated. Regional geopolitics are not getting any easier. Humanitarian crises, as products of climate conflict or both, carry with them high human and financial costs and could spur renewed migration across difficult terrain with risks for those making the journey and impact on the communities that receive them. And finally, there are the opportunity costs as well. The opportunity for the more stable and more prosperous Somalia that we've heard about today one better able to meet its own challenges, including the demographic forces that will profoundly shape it in years to come. And that is an opportunity that neither the Horn of Africa, nor the rest of the world, nor most of all Somalis themselves can afford to lose. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Shannon. Uh, uh, I think we chose wisely, wisely to have you last. Uh, did a great job. Uh, summing things back up and giving us macro perspective and some of these uh, you know, national trends, especially bringing in the environmental and demographic uh, factors that are also uh, uh, underlying drivers that we don't always appreciate to what's going on uh, in Somalia. Um, uh, so lots of us, lots here to, to, to chew on, uh, lots for us now, now to dive into. I think all panelists have made the point that there's been uh, significant, you know, noteworthy progress. There's still a long ways to go. Uh, there's an urgency for reform. Um, and so I'd like to focus our discussion here on really what are the priorities and what can be done, what, what uh, um, should be the priorities for the, the federal government, and what can and should the international partners be doing to more effectively uh, uh, build the bridges <clears throat> to connect where we're at today with the vision that uh, Abdi Saeed has, has laid out. I'd like to get us started um, by asking uh, Abdi Saeed just to um, <clears throat> give us a few thoughts on this point about strengthening the, the efforts between the federal government and the federal member states, um, how can uh, the federal government improve uh, support it's providing uh, to the states and, uh, and, and in the process enhance the, the security capacity um, for communities at the local level, uh, those areas that are most vulnerable to Al-Shabaab today? Thank you very much, and I appreciate also Andre and Dr. Shannon's uh, inputs uh, to this. Uh, the, the federal government and federal member states have have they have existing mechanisms to make uh, decisions that are critical, and this is the National Security Council, where federal member state uh, federal member. Uh, federal member states presidents are members and it's chaired by the president of uh, President Fromaggio and key ministers are there the prime minister is also there and this mechanism is supposed to be the decision, the collective decision making uh, at the highest level uh, especially those decisions that are critical in, in terms of security and, and then um, 
the decisions are then operationally devolved at the regional uh, security council uh, earlier under i mentioned in this we we have been tasked to make sure that the regular holding of this regional security council uh, meetings are, are regularized and the way to do is to have regional security offices established in in at the regional level and my office is actually working very hard to do that and we have recently got funding from uh, one of the donors to the eu to uh, to allow them to actually facilitate for this uh, regional security uh, council to have at least one person that supported and their offices established so that the meetings that are held in, in, in at the regional level uh, are regularized and, and they become normal. You, you know, they, it's not ad hoc, it becomes more systematic. And then when there is uh, decisions that are needed to go uh, or that uh, are needed for our attention, then we take it from there. But the regional security office is the one that follows up and minutes and, and then sends. And it, before we have this in place and, and people at the beginning, it, it will look like a patchwork, but at the end, the end goal will be uh, that something that will be established and it will become normal once people get used to it. And, uh, and then the, the, the individuals, I mean, the, there could be differences between uh, individual leaders uh, in, in certain issues. And these are normal. I mean, it's, it's not something that uh, is supposed to stop everything. Uh, the National Security Council should meet, should dialogue. That, that was the whole purpose of setting up uh, this mechanism, is to have uh, discussions where contentious issues are discussed and agreed and made. Uh, and then one of our, uh, our main uh, focus was also to try to, uh, to, try to um, to try to base, uh, institutionalize uh, decisions that are taken at the National uh, Security Council. For example, uh, earlier it, uh, it was mentioned that the regional security forces should be um, equipped and, and, and support provided by the government. Uh, and it was one of the decisions in the last uh, uh, in the last uh, National Security Council several months ago. For, but the, some of the leaders mm, think that support just should happen automatically. But sometimes it cannot because there has to be a, a system. I mentioned the, the financial governance mechanisms, the public financial management uh, that we are undertaking. We also have set up a mechanism where, uh, because recently after the aura, we implemented some reforms, including that soldiers' weapons, the guns, are registered to the soldier, not to the commander, as, as the, uh, the tradition before. Now, uh, we also set up a weapons and ammunition management system, a mechanism where from the, when the guns and ammunition arrive in the country and the way they are stored, distributed at the unit level. And, and this mechanism includes, uh, the decree was signed recently by the president, it includes also up to the soldier that gets these weapons, uh, that he or she takes oath and is the, the gun is registered is the soldier's number is registered and biometrically. But uh, it's very difficult for people who were used to a process where they uh, call you and take guns and, and then distribute.
who actually accept the system. At the beginning, we will have challenges. So some of the challenges you see uh, are not are not political challenges, but uh, people who want to insist on, on, on the ways they use it to do things. So I think this is where sometimes there, there, are, con there are disputes, but we, we think it is the right uh, way of doing things in, in this new era. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Abdesid, uh, and very much bring us back to this tension that we have all these reforms, at the same time there needs to be processes, so there's the demand of actually, actually um, affecting security on the ground while also building the institutions processes uh, required of, of, um, of uh, creating uh, a, a stable state. So let me open it up uh, to those in the audience. Uh, we'll take a, a couple of questions uh, at once. And, uh, and then we'll have uh, whoever's appropriate from the panel uh, respond. So, uh, Luca, please. Uh, if you could uh, identify yourself. Yeah. Uh, uh, Luca Kual from uh, the center and from South Sudan as well. And you can stand up, Luca. Yeah. The, uh, uh, yes, thank you very much for painting such a very positive picture about Somalia. Uh, just a few questions. This idea of elections and power sharing, that some work has been done to indicate elections in most cases, in such a situation environment like Somalia. People are saying, is it possible for, to look for power sharing and start building the shaken balance rather than rushing to the uh, to elections? Do you think it's a good environment for you to conduct elections now? Or should you look creatively to your own indigenous initiative of how you can really uh, create this issue of power sharing? The second one is about the, uh, how much of such a transition is financed locally? Because most of these transitions, sometimes you rush, you want to build a very huge government rather than building a small one and can match with your own resources. Thanks. OK, thank you. Um, in, the, in the far back, Dan. Hi, uh, this is Daniel Wrenches from Feature Story News. Uh, I really appreciate you all coming and providing such thoughtful comments and context. It really helps in reporting on this area for me and, and my colleagues. Um, we're in Washington, so I, I need to ask you about U.S. policy. Um, and there is a lot of, you know, um, need to report contextually about the drone attacks that the U.S. conducts in Somalia. So I'd like you to provide more information, particularly about how the strategy has changed in the last two years. I know that the volume of attacks has seemingly gone up. And also observe that it seems as if, rather than uh, just focusing on high-value targets, that there's more of an effort to support forces on the ground in more conventional uh, operations. So if you could give me some sense of what that's about, and then uh, some context about whether that is the right strategy uh, and where it should be going. Thank you. OK, and I think there was one more question uh, there on the left side. Thank you. Uh, Chris Bassett from the International Foundation for Electoral Systems. I also wanted to touch on the topic of elections um, with Somalia having set the admirable but also very ambitious goal of having one person, one vote elections in 2020. I would appreciate your insights on the strategy for planning electoral security and the approach to securing the elections uh, in the in an environment with the challenges geographically, demographically, um, and in terms of infrastructure that Somalia faces. So, thank you. Okay, thank you for the questions. Um, let's uh, um, just turn to the panelists and they can answer uh, those parts of each question uh, um, uh, that they uh, feel they have the most to contribute on. So, um, let me start, uh, Andre, with you. 
Yeah, I don't think I have answers to all of these questions, but um, I'll take a stab at it. I mean, definitely Somalia has achieved a certain level of stability um, working through what you referred to as indigenous power sharing solutions. And what we're really talking about here is, you know, power sharing at a, at a clan based level. Um, that means if we look at the way parliamentary seats have been allocated, uh, you know, individual communities sit down, they break out, this is their allocation of numbers, how many MPs come from this. And that has been extremely successful kind of getting everyone inside the tent um, and getting everyone cooperating. We also have governments that at a ministerial level or across the security forces make sure that all of the major communities have representation. And what's interesting is sometimes an individual is chosen from uh, one community, but that community doesn't really think they're part of the, the lifeblood uh, of, of that clan, and then there can be some uh, competition or some resistance to it. So it's always a very, very challenging uh, issue. Um, as I see the process unfolding right now, when we're looking at the establishment of political parties, we're looking at the establishment of what the electoral model is, which has been one of those, you know, kind of critical issues that's actually quite received quite a lot of, um, you know, I don't know, good attention and, and support going forward in the discussions with both the states and the federal government. Um, what they're trying to do is basically marry up the, the, the two so that you can have a formal electoral system where power sharing between the various clan constituencies uh, actually fits together in one. But the concern definitely exists that if you go too fast, too far uh, with the formal electoral model, that you can lose a lot of the benefits of keeping everyone inside the tent um, uh, that we've had thus far. So I, I think that's something that, that merits a lot of discussion because the, situa or the system that's been working has not been perfect, but it has been working better than what we had in the past. Um, on the question of uh, counter al-Shabaab efforts, um, and I think the, the question was specifically asked, you know, are like externally led counterterrorism operations enough? I, I think the, the answer is, you know, no. Uh, externally driven counterterrorism operations need to complement the growth of Somalia's national security forces, which could be intelligence, it could be military, it could be police at the national level, at the state level. Um, but what's really required is communities that are able to secure their own villages, their own towns, with support from state level and national level authorities. And that's going to require a great deal of consensus building, a great deal of reconciliation. Uh, one thing that al-Shabaab is very deft at is its ability to go in and manipulate clan grievances so that if one clan is seen as dominating a federal state or a particular security unit, and that clan has enemies, al-Shabaab will go to those enemies and say, let us be your force multiplier. Let us work with you to resist your traditional, uh, your, your traditional enemies. And that logic needs to be broken down. And we need to be able to take away that opportunity from al-Shabaab by getting the various communities actually working together and all feeling like they are part of this, this national system, this federal system. And I think that goes back to the question of, uh, of indigenous power sharing. I mean, quite often power sharing happens and that brings in all the big guys, brings all the big families, but it leaves out smaller clans, it leaves out minorities. And so that creates the opportunity right there for al-Shabaab to pick up uh, its own proxies. Um, and I'll pause there and pass it down to Abdi Said. Let me just jump in for a second, Andre, because in your remarks you made a, a, a point about that there needs to be more effort to build up the clan resistance to al-Shabaab. Um, um, and, 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 and you're coming back to it now. Uh, what else would you like to see? You know, what else could be done to help uh, the clans in, in, in this resistance? It, it's a good question. I mean, I mean basically, I, I think there was a great deal of support for at least the Islamic Courts Union early on, right? If we go back and, and look at, say, 2006 as an alternative uh, political vision to uh, what had been offered by competing, feuding warlords. Um, Al-Shabaab, which sort of took, out, took over you know, that political trajectory after the Islamic Courts were crushed, Al-Shabaab has absolutely failed to mobilize mass Somali support. Al-Shabaab as, as, a, as a governing institution has failed in terms of famine, in terms of constantly attacking, in terms of coercion of local populations. I think the Somali, Somali society is, is pushing back as hard as it can right now 
against al-Shabaab. It's that they, when there is no countervailing force, there is no opportunity for someone that lives in an al-Shabaab-controlled village to actually uh, resist. And so it's more about not just showing them in terms of counter-violent extremism ideas. It's not about propagating the message. It's about providing a material option for them to join and to be, you know, have support from that is on the doorstep so that they can flip and liberate their village and start working with, if you will, the good side against al-Shabaab. Um, and that's going to need to be you know, introduced through reconciliation negotiations, addressing some very legitimate clan grievances in certain instances, um, but eventually it's going to be about security forces doing the liberation of those villages, and then hopefully handing over control of the village uh, to the local communities themselves so that the Somali security forces can move on and confront al-Shabaab in other locations. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not the uh, election expert, but uh, on... on uh, in, the, in the Somali context, elections, once they happen, if the process is transparent and open, it's accepted. So we, we have gone through several uh, stages. In, in 2012, the elections that uh, happened at, uh, at the president's and the parliament happened in Mogadishu. Uh, 135 elders selected 275 uh, MPs, and those 275 elected the president. In 2016, the, the election has happened in, in six uh, regional uh, capitals, uh, including Mogadishu. And the, and the presidential election happened in, uh, in Mogadishu. Over, over 14,000 people elected. So in... And, and this ties in in the last question on, on also elections. Uh, in 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 the next election in 2020, we we are planning to have election uh, elected uh, representatives that are more representative in 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 the constituencies that they represent, and and it. it we are we are we are trying to expand that space of allowing that or making sure in 2020 these people are able to be elected by their own constituencies and i think the power sharing andrea mentioned explain it on that and and the electoral model is one of those um uh, decision points that we made uh, in the last uh, National Security Council. Uh, the, the other question on how much transition is financed by, uh, by uh, locally, uh, I think we, we need to realize that in Somalia, I mean, uh, there are large parts of Somalia that is not... Uh, that is basically Somalis are providing the security, starting from uh, Somaliland, up north, Puntland, Kalmaduk, all these areas, Amazon is not there. The security is provided by the Somalis themselves and, and financed by, by the regional administration as most. And so the, the transition from Amazon to, if that is, um, what is the question it's about? The transition from Amisom uh, to Somali security, of course, requires a lot of resources because we have to uh, equip and, and train and recover territories from Al Shabaab, and and the Somali security forces require, at, at least the initial uh, few years, require a lot of support in terms of uh, rebuilding and. and equipping and maintaining and and this is this is a institutional memory that is being lost during the civil war and and, and, and the conflict on um, on the election uh, security I think the we, we need to understand the Somali mindset if if people, the largest number of, of, of the population, believe that the elections, 
the way they are set up. Uh, uh, transparent, open, and legitimate process, then there will be no attacks. In fact, a lot, you don't require a lot of security you know, for those elections. Uh, but if the perception is that there was mishandling and manipulation of the, of the leaders, uh, whether local or, or national, then you will tend to have uh, you will tend to have uh, insecurity because some people will have grievances and, and that can manifest itself in into violence. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Shannon. Do you have any thoughts? Um, I would touch briefly on the the on the airstrikes question. I I think that. Um, I mean, airstrikes have been one part of the, of the effort against al-Shabaab, um, and that that's been important to the progress. But as, as has been said, that this is ultimately uh, a fight that, that, you know, will be won by the Somali people on the ground, and it will not be, it's, it's, it's by no means entirely a military fight, um, that it's a much broader effort than that. Um, to touch a tiny bit on the, both the first and the last questions on elections, I would just sort of underscore, um, you know, sort of my perception of, of sort of their importance. Um, I think, you know, the National Security Advisor has rightly sketched out the continuum of progress that has been made there. But I would also just sort of emphasize um, that as much as the international community and others are focused on, on looking at 2020 um, as a really crucial milestone, um, to look beyond there too. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have time for one more round of uh, questions. Um, so let's start back here. Hi, Jeff Prem, Small Arms Survey. I was wondering if you could speak about the um, local sources of Al-Shabaab arms. You mentioned the DAOs that come in for ships. Um, but I was wondering if you could talk about any significant sources from either local regional wars or from um, collections from taxes or anything like that. Thanks. Other uh, questions, comments? Uh, Hugh Brooks, uh, unaffiliated. The uh, uh, regional uh, governments, uh, elections coming up, and people like Mukhtar Robo, former Al Shabaab commanders who have now been barred from running from election, um, but probably going to try and run anyway. Do you see these as potential spoilers? And, you know, as more defectors from Al Shabaab get brought into the fold, is this going to become an ongoing problem for security and stability going forward as they try to exercise their own agenda uh, opposed to uh, that of the federal government? Okay, thank you very much. And over here. Thank you. Uh, Lauren Blanchard with the Congressional Research Service. Um, I'm wondering, uh, uh, Abdi Said, you talked a little bit about regional um, interactions in Somalia, and I'm wondering if uh, any of you could say a bit more about how they might be evolving, particularly in light of the leadership transition in Ethiopia and Ethiopia's engagement with UAE. Um, I know the prime minister is just in uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, are, are things changing, and how are they impacting the tensions between the, the federal member states and the federal government? OK, thank you very much. Um, so why don't we just take those three, and let's go in reverse order. Um, and then uh, give Abdi Said the, the final word here. So, Shannon, would you uh, like to lead us off? Um, I would uh, defer on all three, in fact, to Abdi Said in, in, in most respects. But um, I would just sort of note on uh, Lauren's question about the, the regional uh, developments. Um, I think what's happening, you know, sort of with Ethiopia and Eritrea is incredibly important to the region, um, to the international community as a whole. Um, I think it's, you know, really um, it's been happening, you know, at a remarkable pace. Um, uh, and that, uh, to me, that's a, it's an enormously positive development that will echo out beyond. Yeah, just very quickly, I think uh, Abdi Said can speak to most of these issues authoritatively. Uh, I mean, Al-Shabaab weapon sources, Dow shipments, yes, captured Amosom and SNA uh, material, and then just domestic weapons markets. I mean, we have to be honest. Uh, that that exists uh, <clears throat> has regional connections. So I, I don't think there's necessarily a shortage uh, of weapons. Quite often in the past, you know, we've had good documentation that shortage of ammunition or spikes of prices of ammunition are actually more critical at limiting the length of firefights than than actually shortage of, of weapons themselves. Um, the elections could be 
uh, a destabilizing factor. I mean, that's one of the issues that's at play in the rupture of relations right now between the federal government of Somalia and the federal member states, um, or all of them except Hers Hershbele. Um, I mean, many of the states have complained in their uh, letter from the Council of Interstate Cooperation about interference in their, what they consider, domestic politics. Um, we have the issue now, which is, I think, attracting a lot more attention about, about Robo um, and what his status is. I mean, what's interesting is that someone who literally surrendered to the federal government of Somalia under duress, being you know, surrounded by al-Shabaab, um, has not been controlled uh, sufficiently and is now you know, directly challenging the, uh, the authorities of the federal government um, when you know, the Minister of Internal Security issued a letter saying he couldn't run. So I think that's still an evolving situation, but it, it does show that, he, that some actors are willing to outside, act outside uh, the lanes of the law. And on the diplomatic relations with Ethiopia, I'll really leave that to Abdi Said. Thank you very much. Um, on on Al-Shabaab and weapons, uh, first let me say that uh, uh, because of the sanctions uh, imposed on Somalia, UN sanctions uh, against uh, Somalia, the, all the weapons and ammunition and lethal and non-lethal that get in and come in for the government are reported, registered, and, and, and we are in the process of marking all of them to the individual uh, soldiers. And this, this is, uh, but that's not the case for all other uh, actors in Somalia, including federal uh, member states. Uh, when they import uh, weapons through partners or, or directly, they are not reported and they are not registered, and there is no uh, there is no requirement of complying uh, UN uh, resolutions. But the federal government, so there is a loophole in 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 that uh, UN uh, sanctions resolution that allows this. Uh, the federal government is uh, responsible to report all the weapons that uh, get in the tank in the country, but in the resolution there is article there. So weapons come in uh, through different means, and Al Shabaab gets uh, uh, through either, uh, as Andre mentioned, through locally or from other sources or actors. That uh, some of them even do it openly in the market. But what we have achieved is to recently incidents that happened weapons that were recovered from Al-Shabaab, some of them were traced back to the source because we marked these guns uh, and, and then they were registered to individuals. We, we traced this where the source of these uh, weapons are and those people are, uh, are facing uh, the courts uh, and they are in detention. So on... And, and then the collection of extortion money and, and how Al-Shabaab raises funds. And I, I mean, we, we can talk that uh, there is a lot of uh, literature out there on, on how and the mechanisms. Uh, but what we need to understand is, is the overall extremist project, whether it's Daesh or, or Al-Shabaab, is a political project that is against our vision. And that political project is funded, uh, supported by, by other actors outside Somalia and inside Somalia. And so we, we, our vision, which we laid out, the government, which is much more inclusive, rule-based, uh, uh, a lot of uh, evolution in, in terms of how the systems are, are taking place. And then the political vision of, of the extremists, uh, which we all know, we cannot be neutral on those. Uh, and it's, it's not something that we can afford to say, okay, uh, yes, this is allowed, and, and then we, we will not enable you to defeat this political uh, project. 
For us, from our perspective, the president has been active in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, taking away their arguments that exist, that they use it for the last uh, 10 years. For example, the identity, the Somali identity, the nationalism, the, the corrupt practices that the government was identified with. Uh, so you, you have less corruption, and also we are countering that practice of, of injustice, corruption, uh, uh, protecting the Somali national uh, interest. All this uh, just to defeat the core argument of al-Shabaab and, and, and to own the, the national project and not let al-Shabaab own that. And on, on the ongoing elections in the regional states in, in Southwest and, and Puntlan and next year also Jubaland, this these challenges will be there and, and it shows we, the, the current uh, election for the next month in Southwest, which uh, Robo is competing, it shows that the necessity of having uh, the federal government's role in this, uh, not so necessarily micromanaging, but the arbiter to, to make sure those, uh, those elections are fair, transparent, and on time, and then the, the vetting of, of, of the candidates. Because we, we have, uh, there is this National Election Commission that, that existed actually. It, it was set up uh, and, and, and approved by the parliament in the last government. And it's autonomous of the government. They, they uh, recently even held elections of member of parliament in, in Puntland uh, that was uh, replacing um, someone who vacated a seat. And their role is, is accepted in, in Somalia. But because of certain uh, candidates want to have uh, strong uh, hand on the election outcome, then they will resist and make uh, political arguments against uh, the role of the... But you, we, we just saw that how important that role is to vet and, 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 and make sure that the process is a transparent and an and open process. And then on the regional dynamics, I, I think the, uh, Dr. Shannon earlier mentioned about the population growth in, in the region and in Somalia, and, and also uh, the whole region is a youthful region, uh, including Ethiopia, Somalia, and, and, and other, other countries. And President Formaggio has been focused on the regional economic in integration in the last one year, uh, talking to all these leaders uh, and trying to come up a mechanism where Somalis are infrastructurally linked to the region, to the Horn of Africa region, to Kenya, Ethiopia, Sud all the way to Sudan. And, and that is the only way to, to, to compete and, and try to fix the, the time we are running again is because of the, the large number of, of young people who are unemployed in Somalia. And we cannot uh, create enough jobs to, uh, to meet their demands. So the, uh, the hope is that the regional economic integration, because of the infrastructure, the, the trade of uh, the movement of people and goods and services across the, uh, the borders of the, of the country, uh, this will create uh, a lot of uh, economic uh, impact where we can also, uh, it also undermines Al-Shabaab's recruitment base because if we can employ a lot of young people then or create job opportunities, uh, then you also uh, take away the recruitment base for, for Al-Shabaab. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, um, Abdisaid, and, and thank you to all of the panelists for a very thoughtful and candid reflection on, on the current state of the security landscape in Somalia. I'm struck uh, by a lot of things by what were said here uh, this morning, um, particularly uh, how we're at a point where we're really struggling to connect the vision to the operationalization of these security efforts. And um, Abdesid talked about the transparency efforts. Uh, we talked about the federal state tensions. Um, we talked about the political system and how you create that in a way that's transparent and legitimate, the demography uh, issues. Um, in many ways, uh, we're talking about the states to the, we continue to talk about the state building challenge facing Somalia, but uh, I guess in, in, in a positive way, um, these are more normal types of issues that you're seeing with regular states. And in and, and that way, uh, Somalia is um, facing a higher bar of expectations, uh, which I think is a, is a positive thing. And so with that, uh, I would uh, ask you all to join me in thanking our guest for uh, a wonderful presentation this morning.